is this kind of what you envisioned or maybe even more than you envisioned when you guys got the okay to move to Los Angeles? Kevin, you're on mute. Is that better? Yes. Uh, Gary, to answer your question, I don't know that you could have ever envisioned this exactly the way it's planned out. Uh, you could dream about it, but I think if you're being realistic to move back to Los Angeles to become the first team in NFL history to host a championship game in a Super Bowl in your own stadium, have it be the first year it's open. Uh, and the first Super Bowl in Los Angeles in nearly three decades all come into a confluence uh, and have the Los Angeles Rams have their chance to win their first Super Bowl in Los Angeles. Uh, all of that, I would say if it was a Hollywood script, it would get tossed out because no one would believe it. Um, now, that being said, we still have to go accomplish the last step for all of that to actually come to, to fruition. But the stage is set so far and I, I don't know it's what you envision, it's what you hope, it's what you work for. Uh, it's the challenge that Stan put up to us from the beginning. And I think it goes back to the very first day. Stan's orders to all of us were not to undershoot Los Angeles, uh, to not to leave any stone unturned. And I think what you see right now is the direct result of Stan's challenge to the entire organization uh, to become one of the best organizations in sports and, and to do it on a quick timeline. Thanks very much. Greg Beecham. Hey, Kevin. What do you anticipate this doing for the Los Angeles Rams in terms of winning the hearts and minds of this community that this franchise has such deep roots in but then left for 20 years? Well, Greg, I think it's an unprecedented opportunity for the Los Angeles Rams. And when you get a chance to play in a Super Bowl, that always helps wins hearts and minds. When you get a chance to host a Super Bowl, that obviously helps elevate your brand, the SoFi Stadium brand, the NFL in Los Angeles as a whole. When you combine those two, it's an unbelievably powerful mix uh, to develop that next generation of fandom. And I, I think uh, while the crowd certainly had plenty of 49ers fans last Sunday, it was an unbelievable atmosphere. Uh, I've had more people tell me it was one of the greatest sporting events they've ever attended in their lives, send me pictures of, pictures of families celebrating after the game and the most important thing we can do to build this franchise after being gone for 20 years is to capture the next generation of fans. Uh, there's so many fans who grew up from 1995 to 2016 without a team to root for. Uh, it's our, now that we are back in Los Angeles, that is not the case, but there are so many parents and people who moved here in that time frame who root for other teams as they, as they should. Um, but the best way to capture that next generation, it's not about flipping someone who's a Pittsburgh Steelers fan who grew up in Pittsburgh and moved to Los Angeles and become a Rams fan. That's great if it happens, but that may not be realistic. What it's about is their kids who are eight, nine, 10 years old, growing up wearing Cooper Cup jerseys, wearing Aaron Donald jerseys and becoming lifelong Rams fans. And that's what these two weeks truly are about. That's what this season has been about. And you know, it's not just this year. If you look back through the six years we've been here, it's been a really good run of success, especially since Sean's been here. I think we're the third winningest team. You have three division titles, two NFC championship games, two Super Bowl appearances, uh, you know, a defensive player of the year many times over and Aaron Donald. Uh, you had Todd Gurley win offensive player of the year. Fingers crossed you get Cooper Cup to win offensive player of the year. Sean McVay has been coach of the year. There's so many things that have been the residual success of this team's winning but this is a unique opportunity on the biggest stage uh in the world and you know i believe franchises are a series of opportunities uh to build and connect with you know fans and internally this is the biggest one you could get thank you uh reminder everyone if you have a question raise your hand we'll try to do kind of one a piece and then we can of course circle back you all know kevin is is usually very generous with his time so uh with that we'll go to jordan kevin uh with with that comment franchises being a series of opportunities um when you look at the build itself and how it had to come together and sort of the 
delicateness of phases of it that had to form this ecosystem that you guys have formed. What are some catalytic moments in that? Uh, not just the moves you guys made this year, but overall uh, the build becoming what it is uh, since you guys sort of moved back? Well, I think, you know, you certainly have to trace it back. Again, it starts with Stan's challenge to us to, to be the best organization we can be, uh, to win, you know, quickly, but also to build in a way that is, you know, unique to Los Angeles. And the one thing you know, I think we all talk about is we are in the entertainment business. You know, sports is entertainment. And certainly here, if you look, when I, you know, for me growing up, you know, the Showtime Lakers were the gold standard in the 80s, but the Dodgers were right there with them. And, you know, I remember as a kid, Fernando Mania, and, you know, then you, you move on to all of the great stars the Dodgers have, the Lakers have had. You know, you, I was 12, I think, when the Kings traded for Wayne Gretzky and, and that amazing run and what that, you know, translated to at the forum, you know, in those years. And certainly when you look at Los Angeles, the teams that have been, you know, synonymous with winning have had star power. And maybe that's unique to this market. Uh, but certainly that was a blueprint that has been provided for generations of Angelinos to understand how to win. Uh, and I think that was Stan's challenge to us was it doesn't have to be the same, but you know what it looks like. And, and then, you know, quite frankly, it starts with the hiring of Sean McVay. Um, you know, Stan taking a risk to go hire a 30 year old head coach and to put his faith in him and less to go build a winner, really transform where we were as a franchise. And I think that was the first of a series of risks. It, and it started with Stan being, I think if you go back in time, and this is a little bit out of order, you know, many people had danced around Los Angeles. No one had been willing to say, I'm going to go buy land, build a stadium, bring my team, and really plant my flag without knowing the outcome. Uh, that first risk followed by, you know, Sean McVay, those two risks set us up for where we are today. Uh, I, I think any storyline without those two at the forefront, that those decisions that Stan made um, fall short. From there, I think it was looking at what we had as a team and figuring out how we go build the best possible team we can in each moment. And we were fortunate. Todd Gurley burst onto the scene as, you know, one of the most dominant players in the NFL and you know, 2017, you already had Aaron Donald, who was a bona fide, you know, all pro at that time. And you go steadily, you draft to Cooper Cup, you know, you steadily build each way, but, you know, you can't do it the way other teams do it. And that's not just because of Los Angeles. I think, you know, and I, and I said this last week, there is nothing, you know, more arrogant to me in the NFL than thinking that whoever we have in our building is smarter than everybody else in the other 31 buildings at every position and everything we do is just going to be better than that. That's just not possible. That's not realistic. Uh, you have to have greater humility and understanding of the NFL than that. And so for us, it started with how can we put together a plan that is unique to Los Angeles Rams that we think will give us a competitive advantage. And that competitive advantage, if we've had one, has been built on Sean McVay and the coaches and their culture that they have developed, the way they develop players and, you know, a unique and terrific working relationship with Les Snead and the personnel staff to go find the kinds of players that our coaches value and develop. And when you look at, you know, there is no better, sure, Cooper Cup and Matthew Stafford, you know, had amazing, you know, games and offense, but the plays of the game were made at the end by Aaron Donald, sure. Traven Howard, a seventh round pick from three years ago. Nick Scott stepping in, you know, in the playoffs to starting safety, a seventh round pick. Greg Gaines nearly intercepts a pass to seal the win, a fourth round pick. You know, those were the kinds of plays that you look at overall that make a difference. Um, Matt Gay kicking the game winning field goals the last two weeks was, you know, a signed off a practice squad. And I think when you look at this team, I think there was a, Albert Breer broke it down last week that we had 33 homegrown players between draft picks and undrafted free agents, which led all the teams in the conference championships. People don't think that about us. They don't remember that we've had the second most draft picks, I think, in, since 2017 of any franchise. They just look at the, the shiny objects, as Les calls them, the number one picks, 
and say, well, that's how you build a team. And sure, that's great. But Jalen Ramsey was, I think, the fourth or fifth pick overall. You know, and, you know, Matthew Stafford was the first pick overall. We can go acquire those and we use first rounders to do it. And maybe that's not for everybody. And maybe it's not sustainable. <laughs> maybe it doesn't work long term. We seem to figure that out every year. But it's working right now. Um, and in this moment of time, you, know, you, you sit there and what has been amazing is when we get these players who we acquire via trade or, you know, Vaughn Miller in a trade or an Odell Beckham, not only do we have an amazing culture that they not only adapt to, but help lead. I think you can look at, you know, certainly Vaughn and Odell's leadership over the past two months as, as catalyst for our success um, in that time, but also they want to stay. And, you know, when you get a Jalen Ramsey, when you get a Matthew Stafford, you know, when you, you trade these players, you sign them as free agents and Andrew Whitworth, a Robert Woods, they all want to be here long-term. And I think that's a unique combination of the market, the culture that's been set by Sean and Wes, the coaches and the other players, SoFi Stadium, and, and just, you know, the success the team has had. But without all of that coming together collectively, this could fail spectacularly. It could still fail spectacularly, right? You never get to a point, I think, when you're building a team where you say, this works and we've proven it works. Just because it worked in 2022, 2021, 2022, doesn't mean it's going to work in 2022 and 2023. And by then you might need a different plan. But I think that's the difference that, you know, if there's one thing I would say sets our group apart, it's adaptability. It's being willing to look at something one year and make a change the next year because nothing is permanent in this league. And, you know, I think, you know, if you look at, you know, five-year plans, uh, that's all changed in sports. And, and I don't think we think we're on a five-year plan, although Les always points out to me, maybe this is year five of a five-year plan. Um, I think that's taking, you know, causation and correlation aren't the same thing. And, and I like to point that out to him all the time, but uh, there are a confluence of factors, but I think it starts with the challenge of be entertaining take the advantages that come with Los Angeles and then the terrific work that Sean Les, the coaches and the personnel group do in harmony to maximize every opportunity we get. That was a really long answer to a question. Sorry. It's great though. Thank you. I appreciate it, Kevin. Well, it's good. The athletic doesn't really have editors, so you can print all of that. <laughs> with that, we'll go to Eric. Hey, Kevin. Thanks again for making the time. Uh, two questions for you. You mentioned kind of the storybook, uh, you know, process that you guys have went through since you you come here. Uh, that said, is there anything that you would have done differently when you look back over these five years that you guys have been here? And then the second one is, how much do you value the opportunity to kind of show off what you guys have done here in Los Angeles to the rest of the league with them, with them coming to LA? Yeah, Eric, we wouldn't have gone four and twelve the first year back. <laughs> Uh, I, I can promise you that that wasn't part of, of the plan or, or the storybook uh, discussion. But I do think that did help set the tone for us reimagining everything in the organization um, and what we could be. And, and I, I think, uh, as is true with most things in life, you learn the most from your greatest failures. Um, and I still remember standing you know, at the podium in a press conference in December when we made a change at head coach and saying, this is an organizational failure uh, and it's on all of us. And I think we believe that and we felt that. And I think the success we've had since then is the direct reflection of everybody in our organization looking at their role in the four and 12 season and saying, we have to be better. We have to get better, right? And I think, you know, that goes back to Jordan's question, you know, a little bit of a catalyst and you can talk about all the factors in moving a team and setting up shop and all those things in one year. But, you know, that was not part of the plan, uh, but I think it helped craft, you know, where, where we wound up. Look, everything else you were saying, we, we would have beaten the Patriots in <laughs> Super Bowl 53. Uh, we would not have missed the playoffs in 2019. I mean, there are plenty of things that haven't gone, you know, the way you script. Uh, maybe this year has, although, gee, we probably don't lose three games in the middle of the season in a row. Uh, you know, if you want to build a great script, but, you know, things work out, right? If you, you're, you know, I, I've never been more frustrated than I was the night of week 18, losing to the 49ers the way we did, but ultimately that probably paved the right path in the playoffs that allowed us to host 
an NFC championship game and potentially get to the Super Bowl. So, you know, things work out in, in mysterious ways. Um, but, you know, I, we have been fortunate to have amazing success, but it has not been without it. It's pitfalls, uh, you know, and, and it's failures. Kevin Manesh. There's a second part to the question. Sorry. Sorry, Eric, was there a second part? Yeah, are you looking forward to being able to kind of just show off Los Angeles with all eyes on the Super Bowl uh, in the coming two weeks? Yeah, I, I remember being in the room in Charlotte when Los Angeles was approved for to host its first Super Bowl, you know, in, in three decades. Um, I remember losing sleep every night when it seemed like construction was falling behind that we were not going to be able to host the 2020 Super Bowl and like waking up with a twitch in my eye each day. And, you know, just, you know, you felt so badly for the league. We, we had stepped up to deliver this amazing stadium to host the Super Bowl. And, you know, we were going to have to push it back. Uh, all of that, you know, similar to, you know, whether it's 2016 or, or losing three games in a row, what an amazing ending it wound up with us being able to host this year, you know, after, you know, the stadiums were empty in 2020, first year in your stadium, you get to host the Super Bowl. I was always excited to showcase Los Angeles, SoFi Stadium, what a terrific NFL market this is, and reestablish Los Angeles as the sports and entertainment capital of the world, whether the Rams were playing in the game or not. And I think everybody in our organization would have loved that opportunity. And I'm sure the Chargers feel the exact same way. Uh, and we were proud to do this together for the NFL. Uh, does it make it that much more special because we're here to get to to show off our home stadium, uh, to play in it, you know, hopefully to see it full of, you know, plenty of Rams fans and, and to feel that energy in this city for the next two weeks? Absolutely. Uh, you would be lying if you said that it's not a little bit extra special to showcase uh, the best of the Rams and the best of Los Angeles together uh, on the NFL's biggest stage. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate it. Kevin Modesti, you're up. Uh, hi, Kevin. Um, what do you see as the the big differences between uh, uh, the the Super Bowl team of three years ago, or the way it felt going into that, and the way it is and the team and how it feels uh, today? Uh, and as part of that, I guess what. What changes, what differences have you seen in Sean McVay over the recent years? Now, look, the teams aren't, I mean, strangely enough, even though we're only three years removed from playing the Super Bowl, teams are very different. Um, I think there's something of our, you know, 25 starters, if you include special teams, only five. I believe it's Andrew Whitworth, Rob Havenstein, Tyler Higby, Aaron Donald, and Johnny Hecker, the only starters who are on both teams. And that's a little bit wonky because Cooper Cup missed the Super Bowl in 2019 and, and Robert Woods will miss this one. Um, but that's an amazing, I mean, you think about 20 new starters out of 25. I mean, that's 83.3% of your team as starters have changed over in three years. And I think that gets back to Jordan's point of every team is different. Every team evolves. And, you know, if you said, hey, you're going to be in two Super Bowls in four years, but your team is going to 83 percent of your starters are going to change. I think that reflects upon how our model might be a little bit different than others. Um, and also the evolution you know, of the team. I think in 2017, 2018, you know, our offense and Sean's offense kind of went on this meteoric rise that, that no one had seen in a while in the NFL. Uh, then, as the NFL does, people caught up to it. They adjusted and, and we had to adjust. And I think the way our team operates now is a reflection of the adjustments that the NFL has made, you know, to Sean in this system, you know, in those years. And, and I think the way Sean coaches is a reflection of the changes to, you know, the system in those years. But, you know, I, I think it's an amazing testament to how quickly the NFL changes to see that, you know, the differences in those teams. Obviously, you know, I think for all of us in the organization, we had no clue what it was like to be in the Super Bowl, uh, you know, when we headed to Atlanta, you know, the, the lead up to those two weeks, I mean, everybody was scrambling. And, and I remember talking to the Patriots and especially the crafts, you know, when we got to Atlanta, you know, such admiration for what they had done when you realize they've been in nine Super Bowls, I think in 18 years and everything it takes to get into going to a Super Bowl and what that means for your organization, everything that has to go right. 
um, from the day the league year starts in March until, you know, when you play in February. I mean, that's basically 11 months where almost everything you do has to break the right way for you to have a chance to play in the Super Bowl. And, and just the admiration for a team that had done it, you know, nine times in, in 18 years and the lessons you learned in, and you went into that game and you would say, you know, the experience wasn't a factor, right? But it absolutely is. And I, I think we all look back and realize, because now, you know, I think our organization is so far ahead of where we were when we went to Atlanta in terms of planning, understanding. And yes, we don't have to get on a plane and travel. We don't have to deal with those things. But even if we had to, we would know exactly how we would do that, what changes we would make. And, and there's a lot of learning. And, you know, the one thing I... I you know, and probably less would put this best, right? Our organization, less and strong, constant learners. Everything we do about this organization is about learning from what we've done, how we improve it, how we get better, and the mistakes we've made and how not to make them again. And, and I think from everything we did in the Super Bowl, it's not to say we did everything wrong last time, but you learn from that. You put in a file and you hope you get to use it again. And I think that's exactly where, where we sit today and whether how, you know, I'm sure when you guys get a chance to talk to Sean and the coaches, how they're preparing the game plan, not in terms of what they're going to call or what they do, but how they implement it, how they practice, the schedules, what we do for the player, you know, that's all an improvement um, upon where we were in Atlanta because we have the chance to look back and and refine. And the Bengals, you know, they will have the same opportunity because Zach was on that staff, you know, in, in 2018. So Zach can draw from, you know, those lessons, you know, as well. But the more times you get repetitions and anything like going to the Super Bowl, the better you're going to be at planning, you know, and getting ready. Uh, we'll go to Bill Plaschke next. Yeah, Kevin, uh, in, in virtually every other city in the country, the NFL team owns the market. You guys are probably, I don't know, maybe fourth here. You know, you've been moving up. Is How important is the next two weeks to making more inroads in the market? How important is it? to win the game, to make inroads in the market. How important basically is your mission? It seems like the, your, your mission from the start has been to, as you said, become an LA team and, and rank up there with the Lakers and Dodgers. How, how, how important is all that? And can you ever can you ever own this market? I absolutely believe that we can own this market. Um, and, and, and I think that's probably the wrong thing to say. I absolutely believe that we can be at the level the Dodgers and the Lakers have been. Um, and continue to, but th those teams have been decades of success and championships and building a fan base, building a deep multicultural fan base, um, you know, stars, legends, hall of famers and building on consistency. And I think that that's why the answer to your question, Bill, is the next two weeks are important, but so is 2022 and so is 2023. You know, there is no, you cannot get to be at the pinnacle of this market by having one great season. You get to the pinnacle of this market by having great season after great season, after great decade, after great decade, and building fans and generations of fans with that. And that only comes with sustained success and sustained investment in the market, in the community, in schools, you know, building relationships. That's not overnight. And I think, you know, one of the things, you know, in, in 2018, it all happened so fast. We were three years back in the market and you're in the Super Bowl. We are in such a better position to capitalize on the Super Bowl opportunity than we were three years ago, just because it's been double the time in the market and people have gotten to know our stars and, and a Cooper Cup and an Aaron Donald, you know, and a Robert Woods and a Jalen Ramsey and Sean McVay, like they're household names at this point. But, you know, it would be naive to think that the next two weeks is some kind of magic potion that, that changes and sets us up for the next two decades. The next two weeks will set us up for the next short period of time. And then that short period of time has to build upon the previous years to have success. And you know, this is an unbelievably competitive market. You have 12 professional teams, two major universities and everything else that goes with it is what makes Los Angeles so unique. It's also the challenge that brings out the best in our franchise. You have to want to be the best to work for the Rams, to be in this market, to put yourself in position. You have to you know, have Stan's vision to go build SoFi Stadium 
as the world's greatest sports entertainment district to build Hollywood Park. Those are all pieces of the foundation, but there is no, you know, this is not the finishing piece over the next two weeks, whether you win or you lose. There is never a finishing piece in Los Angeles. The work in Los Angeles has to go on each day. And we could be playing in the Super Bowl two decades from now, talking about how important it is to continue to build the fan base. Have we closed that gap? Absolutely. And that's, you know, there are 300 people who come to work every day at the Rams organization whose sole focus is on making the Los Angeles Rams the best organization we can be. But that can't be measured against are we better than the Dodgers? Are we better than the Lakers? Are we better than the Kings? Are we better than the Sparks? Do we measure up to UCLA and USC? It has to be no different than the team build formula. It has to be something that's unique to us that we can own and grow and plant those seeds. And do I think the next two weeks will go a long way to helping us? Absolutely. Um, do I think it is the be all and end all for our franchise? I think that would be way too short-sighted and our challenge is so much greater than that. And I hope we rise to it you know, every day. And, you know, if we're fortunate enough to win this game, you know, maybe there'll be a couple of days off after that, but then the job is going to be to go capitalize on that and keep going. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Steve Weish. Kevin, to, uh, to kind of dovetail off of that, you know, because it's LA, uh, because the Pro Bowl is a couple hours away in Las Vegas, pr practically half the NFL is going to be in this market watching the home team play. You have a lot of ambassadors who love playing here, who speak well of the organization. How do you think playing this game in L.A., in this climate, in that stadium, is going to help your team be more attractive to potential free agents or people who want to come here um, just because of everything you're going to have in place all of next week, especially your team playing in that stadium? I think there are three things that are most attractive to free agents. One a winning team, two, great coaches, three, a winning culture. That's all I think that, that matters to, to attracting the best players. And, you know, right now, you know, at this moment in time, you know, I feel confident that we have those three elements, but I don't, you know, the best thing about the NFL is players know. Players know what are the good places to play and where they want to be. And, you know, I think the greatest testament to that is when you go trade for Vaughn Miller, who spent his entire career in Denver and how he talks about his experience in Los Angeles as a Hollywood script and an ending. And that was meant to be Odell Beckham having the chance of, to choose from, you know, a dozen teams and to come here at the time and be the third or fourth receiver and to talk about how he was meant to be in Los Angeles and his experiences here. Matthew Stafford leaving, having the chance to leave Detroit, essentially handpick where he goes and choosing Los Angeles. That's, to me, the validation of what Sean, Les, and Stan have built. It's not about the next two weeks. It's not about the spotlight. It's not about being the media. It's players, when they have a choice to go anywhere they want, have chosen to come here. And there are lots of other players, places the players have chosen to go. We're not the only great choice in the NFL. We're not the only winning atmosphere, the only winning culture, the only place with great coaches. But the chance to do all that in a city with great weather and the NFL's, in my opinion, the NFL's best stadium in one of the largest media markets, that's a really powerful combination. But it is all on the back end of do you do the basic thing right? Can players come here, perform their best, enjoy the culture and have a chance to win? And those answers have to be yes. And no matter what we do in the next two weeks, if those answers aren't yes next March and April, then what happens right now isn't gonna matter. Kurt, we're going to you next. Kurt, can you unmute or we'll come back to you? There we go. Sorry, my phone was not agreeing. Hey, Kevin, thank you for your time all this time. Congratulations. My uh, just one question is there's only so many hours in the day. It's one thing to be in a Super Bowl if you were in a Super Bowl. How does it compare for you personally compared to Atlanta 
um, back in 18, uh, what you need to do and what you need to accomplish as the host? You know, I, in some ways it's easier, in some ways it's much harder, Kurt. It is easier in the fact that our team doesn't have to get on a plane on Sunday, fly, set up in a hotel, move everything, and go through those logistics and spend time talking about that. We're going to be fortunate enough to you know, practice at Cal Lutheran in the next two weeks. We're going to be fortunate enough the NFC team hotel is our team hotel you know, in season. That's an easy transition for our players to go to on Saturday night. They don't have to go walk the stadium and learn and, you know, figure out the angles and the light. Like they know the stadium in and out. Uh, they don't have to worry about how their family is going to get, you know, to the Super Bowl city. You know, they're here. They obviously have friends and family coming with them. So I think from a team perspective, it's much easier from a true football preparation standpoint, much, much easier. From an organizational standpoint, it's much harder. Right, because you you layer in all the responsibilities you have to the host committee, to making sure it's an unbelievable environment, to all the work that you had already set up, plus adding in now that you're playing in the game, you know all of the the added elements of you're trying to combine your Rams ecosystem on a daily basis and a game basis with the Super Bowl. Make no mistake, this is the NFL's game. Right, they are the experts on Super Bowl. They have taken over SoFi Stadium. And, and I know a lot of people write tongue in cheek, like it's great to be out all the Rams or the visiting team. You know, I don't view us as the visiting team. I view us as a neutral site team, right? Both teams are neutral site teams, right? The NFL comes in and takes over the stadium. Uh, Peter O'Reilly, you know, Aubrey Walton, their group, they do an amazing job. So it's not like, oh, we need to help them. They have worked on this plan for two years. Our job is knowledgeable so SoFi Stadium to assist them. But you know, what we have is we have season ticket holders who all, you know, they want to be there. Our partners want to be there. Our suite holders want to be there. Our fans want to be there. Everybody wants to be closer to the action because the Rams want to be it. How you blend that into two years worth of planning. And Kathy Schlossman and her team have done an amazing job, you know, from the Champion LA and the LA Sports Entertainment Commission host side. But obviously everything we had laid, all those plans get upended in, you know, it's not that we're superstitious, but you never want to be like, oh, we need to build a separate plan in case we're in the game, right? Like that would be a waste of time. I mean, even though, I mean, it's a crazy 55 years, the NFL, 54 years, no one had ever hosted a game, you know, and been in it in two straight years, it's happened. You know, but this is now the first time that the stadium is full um, and that you kind of plan for that. So, you know, I think from a logistics standpoint, it is much harder for our team, but you know, I, I would put our organization up against Indian sports. Um, you know, the men and women who come to work here every day, you know, have amazing pride. They're excited. Uh, there are not enough hours in a day to do what they're attempting to do. But, you know, we could only try to pull this off because of the strength of our organization top to bottom. Uh, and it's been a joy watching them go to work. And, you know, I think we'll pull it off. I think in two weeks we'll look back and say, you know, this was the greatest adventure of our lives, but, you know, it will not be uh, without a lack of sleep. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Good luck. Nick Hamilton, going to you next. Hey, Kevin. Um, wanted to talk to you about, you mentioned earlier about obviously LA being the Dodgers and Lakers town that it is, um, and you guys coming back uh, from St. Louis. But from a community aspect, um, what were some of the, the the ideas and the philosophies that you guys had to go over and to ensure that they will actually work? And then what are you seeing now as some of those plans uh, that you guys envisioned and wanted to execute? Do you feel like they've come to fruition, uh, at least if not fully close to being to, to that that level that you guys envision? Nick, it's a great question again. I And I couldn't stress this enough. Nothing is ever fully done. Um, and in our six years here, I could not be more proud of the work we've done hand in hand with the community. And, you know, I look, you know, first place I would go to is a program like the Watts Rams, um, which is hard to believe six years ago, we walked in and that program as we said, it was the Watts Bears, right? And since then they've adopted the Rams, you know, we've gotten involved hand to hand, done so many amazing things, you know, with that program, which not only promotes youth football and the opportunities that come with that, it's made a huge difference in the Watts community. It's you know, been a huge part of policing relationships between the LAPD and Watts. I can look at the work we've done with City Year, um, 
in Englewood and South LA and Watts and East LA and the educational opportunities that's opened up you know, throughout the public school system. I can look at the work with the United Way. You know, the first Walk United was the only community event, you know, at actually SoFi Stadium that has been hosted since it's been open and our powerful work with the United Way, you know, in that time to fight educational injustice and social injustice and housing injustice. You know, those elements, you know, are only growing. And I think when you get back to, you know, both, you know, the questions that have been asked, you know, of how does this game impact those opportunities? It just strengthens those bonds. It gives pride every person who we have worked with over the past six years, those community groups feel a greater connection to Los Angeles and the Rams because we were playing the Super Bowl than they may would otherwise. And so when I think of all of those community groups that we work with, whether it's Operation Progress or the Brotherhood Crusade or the Heart of LA, and I could go on and on, investment in the community has borne fruit, right? And, and one of the things that SoFi Stadium is an amazing building, but we know not everybody has an opportunity to go to a Rams game. We know not everybody has a chance to interact with players. How do we go solve, you know, some of those challenges? It, it's one of the, you know, I could not be more excited. In it. We've raised $2.5 million through our 50-50 program on game day uh, this year. Our 50-50 program at the NFC Championship, I believe, broke every record in uh, American sports history against the 49ers for any raise, right? So, and you think about that, that's 1.25 million that has been raised to be invested in the community through the Rams Foundation. And, you know, we can talk about the Sean McVeighs and the less needs of the world. You know, I don't know that there's a greater hero in our organization than Molly Higgins, who oversees our community development and what she has meant to the growth of this franchise and in those communities uh, is night and day. Jonathan Franklin, uh, one of the first hires coming back to Los Angeles when the Rams came back, uh, his involvement in working with youth football, with social justice programs, his leadership in the community. Uh, those are two of the most outstanding people we have in our organization. And they have picked up everything that's great about the Rams, brought it to our community and multiplied that effect uh, in ways we could not hope. And, you know, what I hope is, you know, we have a number of plans over the next two weeks to really engage you know, the community to make them feel part of it, you know, to bring along those groups that we've, that we've worked with over the past six years. So they're involved in the Super Bowl. They're involved in part of this. And, you know, and then, you know, this is my plug, fingers crossed uh, for Andrew Whitworth uh, being a finalist, hopefully for Walter Payton Man of the Year. He's been an amazing nominee. Uh, I know that every team believes that their nominee is deserving uh, of winning, but you could talk about a lot of fairy tale endings uh, for the Los Angeles Rams. If Andrew Whitworth can somehow find his way to YouTube theater to be one of those finalists with a chance to win Walter Payton Man of the Year, that would say as much, it would certainly say a lot about Andrew and Melissa and their organization, but it would also highlight the amazing work that has been done in this community by Andrew, by our players, by our team, as a great representative for what a change agent sports and, and the Los Angeles Rams can be here in Los Angeles. Thank All you. right. Up next, we'll go to Jim Alexander. Hey, Kevin, thank you for doing this. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe other organizations have been stealing from trying to steal from your blueprint and whether it's, whether it's a roster composition, hiring a young coach, what you've done with the stadium, what you've done in the community. Do you get the sense that that you're seeing what you guys have done in other places with other franchises? I wouldn't wish that on anybody, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, this has been an amazing road. I don't think there's anything here that's uh, replicable, right? I mean, you start with an owner who has given us every opportunity to spend to build the world's most amazing stadium, to spend to the salary cap and then some to build, you know, an amazing roster to, you know, take the risk to go hire a 3 year head coach. I, I think uh, was it last week? I, I lose track of weeks in the playoffs, right? You guys had Sean on and, you know, it was his birthday and he was talking about how insane it was to go hire a 30 year old coach. And later that day, he looked at me and it's like, you guys were insane. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we are. Yes, we were. And I, you know, I, I think, uh, 
you know, there's probably a level of insanity, you know, that goes with that. And, you know, but I, I think where it's different is, I don't know that you could try this anywhere else. You can't try to build SoFi Stadium in any other market except Los Angeles, right? I don't know that the way we build and construct our team would work in, in any other market, with any other group, with any other owner. Um, and look, I, I don't think, I would not advise anybody to copy what we do, not because I, I think that they couldn't do it. I just think you have to find what's uniquely yours um, and, and build into that and lean into that and make that special. And, you know, what, you know, the Bengals have done is amazing and a great opportunity for Cincinnati. When you look at, you know, certainly what the 49ers have, have done in their market, they're, in, you know, an elite traditional franchise in the NFL, the chiefs, you know, what they've done with Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes is fantastic. I, you could look at everybody and say, here are the great parts of models. You could look at different sports teams, you know, what the Warriors, you know, have done in the NBA, you know, what the Milwaukee Bucks have done. You know, I can look at our, our sister teams uh, in Denver, the Avalanche right now lead the NHL in, in points and, and have built an amazing team, you know, themselves. You know, you can look at what Arsenal is doing with an amazing youth movement, uh, getting them back to the top of the table in the English Premier League. Um, every team has to go find their own way to go build. Uh, and just because, you know, this is one way that we've done it, uh, it is not for the faint of heart. It's not for the faint of wallet. Um, and, you know, we have to prove that this is going to be successful because, you know, and you know, I read Bill Plaschke's columns. We haven't won anything yet. So I'm not sure that, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we need to go prove that this can work and that we can continue to do it. So, you know, would I recommend it to anybody? Not on a million years. Um, but, you know, what I, what I would tell anybody and my friends and peers around the league is, you know, be true to your organization, be true to yourself and, and blaze your own path um, and, and let, it, let it see where it goes from there. And, you know, but I wouldn't recommend the last six years on anybody. Thank you. We're going to Brett Knight from Forbes next. Hey, Kevin, thanks for doing this. Um, so, you know, you've been able to, to build the Rams into, you know, really one of the, the NFL's most valuable franchises. And you're obviously riding, riding a high right now. You've got this ascendant team and new stadium and this, you know, national showcase here. So just wondering um, what, what's next for you? I, I know you've mentioned the, the importance of, you know, sort of consistent winning and, and carving out the, your place in the market, but is there anything else you can do to, to sort of capitalize on this moment and build for the future, whether that's with your fans or your partners or, or anything else with the organization? Oh, I, Brett, I think the great part about the Rams is we're just scratching the surface of what we can become. And, you know, I, it's such a unique journey because we were Los Angeles' first professional sports team. You know, we had 50 years in the market, but even that is, you know, a mix of Los Angeles and Orange County. Um, and then you come back, and, and so people know the Los Angeles Rams. They think of the Los Angeles Rams, but we're still in our infancy, you know, of this part of the journey. Uh, and, you know, so from there, it is a constant way of how do we build a better organization? You know, how do we build better inroads in the community? And I think it starts with, you know, answering Bill's question. You can never conquer Los Angeles. You never get to the top of the mountain here. You only keep continuing to grow. You know, a market of 20 million, until there are 20 million Rams fans in Los Angeles, there's always going to be work to be done in Los Angeles and growing the market. I, you know, I was so excited. I thought, you know, our ratings this past week for the NFC Championship game were the highest non-Super Bowl ratings since game seven, a non, I should say, aside from the Super Bowl, the highest sporting event, Jen, uh, this is tongue twister. I should have said it's better. Our game against the 49ers in the NFC Championship was the highest rated Super Bowl Highest rated sports event, non-Super Bowl, since the 2010 Lakers-Celtics Game 7 final. I think that's an amazing testament to the growth of the Rams, the popularity in the market, and where we're headed. But your goal is next year, you're going to break past those ratings, right? 66% of the televisions that were watching television in Los Angeles had their eyes tuned to both our Buccaneers game and our 49ers game. That's an amazing number that's unheard of. Close to 2 million Angelinos were watching the game. That still means that 18 million Angelinos weren't. 
right? So I think that's the challenge for the organization. How do you continue to make those inroads? How do you build? How do you continue to grow into Orange County and the Inland Empire, Antelope Valley, into you know, Ventura County? That is all fertile ground uh, for us to continue to grow our brand. I think the other next steps, you know, January 1st, we were granted the rights to, to market in Mexico, to market in China, to market in Australia. That's a great opportunity for, for us um, as you think about how you grow. Los Angeles being such an important international city, you know, how we market, how we grow, you know, the inroads we make there. I think we're, you know, the first or second most popular team uh, in China. We're fortunate. Taylor Rapp, the only Chinese American player, has really helped us there, as has, you know, winning in our efforts there. Australia, how do we make more inroads, you know, with that community that basically anytime they come to the United States has to come through Los Angeles and fly right over our stadium. Obviously, a terrific relationship with Mexico, uh, given Los Angeles, Mexico, the connections there. Uh, how do we get back there and play a game um, that we actually get to play at this time? And, you know, how do we go engage with the community and build those relationships? We have a Super Bowl sweepstakes going on in Mexico right now to win tickets to the Super Bowl that, you know, over 25,000 people have signed up and to participate. And those were numbers as of last week. You know, that is where the growth is going to come from. And, you know, I, I believe our organization can be one of the top 10 sports brands in the world. Uh, right there with the Lakers, Dodgers, uh, Yankees, Cowboys, Manchester United, Barcelona, Arsenal, Arsenal. That is where our growth is. And that's going to take relentless execution, uh, an amazing staff uh, to imagine what the future looks like, uh, an amazing you know, football team that continues to try to win games and be competitive. But you know, your work here is never done. And you know, I... Our goal is to be, you know, an unbelievable place to work, an unbelievable organization that helps the community in Los Angeles and an organization that people look at and say, that is how it is done in a first class manner, both in your market and in the world. And, you know, that isn't something that happens overnight. That is decades of work uh, to come and generations of our staff and our fans you know, are going to have to help deliver on that promise. Next, we'll go to Dennis. Kevin, can you hear me? I can. Okay. How are you doing today? Fantastic, Dennis. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Um, how would you describe the Rams brand or culture, and how much does your community engagement help or is reflective of that brand? Look, I, I think our brand is, is growing and evolving. Right now, I think people view it as exciting, you know, younger, progressive, um, engaged, you know, there are lots of ways to describe it. It's probably a better question for our CMO, you know, Kat Frederick. She, she would be able to give you exactly what, what the brand is. But, you know, I, I think when we came back, you know, our viewpoint was we wanted to become, you know, the modern sports brand of Los Angeles, that there was a space there. And I think you know, there's been a lot of talk on, you know, on this conversation about the Lakers and the Dodgers. They have an amazing brand. They have amazing brands. Um, their generations in the building, they're more probably traditional, just given that history. Uh, then you look at the Kings who have a, a terrific brand and what they've done, and a, you know, really a passionate fan base. You look at the work that LAFC and the Galaxy have done in soccer, um, you know, in, in dividing that market. I think for us, the opportunity to go reflect the best of Los Angeles, the best, the best of culture and music and food and fashion and bring all that together in a powerful way. Um, represented in a sports brand, that's what we strive for. Um, but it, you know, we went through a rebrand to to modernize, you know, our look and feel, you know, to align with our stadia and where we are now. That's just two years in, and one of those years was a pandemic year. Um, so, you know, I, I think we're we're like everything. We're at the beginning stage. We have amazing wind at our back, but you know, it is getting involved in the community. I think that's community service has been a hallmark of our brand. You know, I think when you look at, you know, our team, you know, over time, you know, the progressive nature, you know, you can look at Kenny Washington and Woody Strode and, you know, reintegrating the NFL in 1946. Uh, you can look at Shaq Harrison, you know, who it was so great to see him on stage, you know, with Stan Kroenke presenting the trophy, you know, our, our first uh, African-American quarterback. You look at Michael Sam, who, you know, first openly gay player drafted. You look at our team to have, you know, first male cheerleaders integrated into, you know, our cheerleading group. 
so on and so forth. Uh, you know, our leadership team, you know, over 50% female, uh, our staff, 50% female. You look at, you want to talk about one of the unsung heroes of this week, uh, Sophie Harlan, who is our director of football operations, who, you know, is the highest ranking female in football operations, you know, in the NFL. She's basically single-handedly carrying the Super Bowl, you know, planning on her back from, from a football perspective. You know, the trust and the faith that we have in our people, um, in our diversity, in our culture is amazing. And, and I think that's one of the ways, you know, I want people to look at our brand. Um, and, and But it still comes into, we as an organization have to be a reflection of Los Angeles at every turn. That is how people buy in. That is how people, we grow it. And that is going to be this, our strength long term. Thank you. Maria, we're going to you next. Hey, Kevin, thank you so much for doing this. I'm, I'm curious, we have often heard the players talk about we, not me, especially Cooper Cup, that it's so important that they all buy in. When you look at the relationships you've built with Sean, with Les, what is the commonality that you see, that maybe you all see in each other that makes it work? Uh, I think we're all crazy in a good way. Um, <laughs> you know, and we joke about that all the time. I mean, I think, you know, Sean, it, and I, I say this, and, you know, for the five years when people, you know, even started asking, you know, who's the next Sean McVay? What makes Sean McVay tech? I said, he's the most amazing leader and communicator I, I've ever been around um, in terms of the way he relates to people. When you are in Sean's orbit, you feel like the most important person in his orbit. He has just this unique way of connecting with players, with coaches, with staff, with everybody in the building that makes you feel better for being around Sean McVay. Uh, but what he is, he's passionate about football and he's passionate about culture. Uh, when you get around Les Snead, um, I don't think you could ever describe Les Snead unless you had about eight hours um, to go through the mannerisms, the colloquialisms, you know, how he talks, how he thinks. But, you know, here's a pre-med major um, who basically decided to give that up to football. One of the smartest people I've ever been around. Um, and you wouldn't know it because he can't remember our players' names or, you know, he, he has rambling sentences that go on and on, but he's a genius. But he's passionate about football. He's passionate about culture. He's passionate about pushing the envelope into new ways to think about players, talent acquisition. He's fearless. Sean is fearless. And so I think when you get into it, right, people who are passionate about culture, passionate about developing people, passionate about developing relationships, and who are fearless. Those are people you want to go to work with every day. And I think the we, not me embodies the culture, the fearlessness, the trust that they place, you know, in, in one another. And I love watching the two of them work, uh, how they come together. But also, it's not just them. It's the 20 plus coaches who have that relationship. It's the 20 plus scouts and the analytics team and the nerds nest and everything else that comes to build our organization. It's Dan Dimitrison in video. It's Brendan Berger in equipment. It's Jock McClendon, you know, in, in player affairs and growing that, you know, it's Tony Pastors who may not be as crazy or as eccentric, you know, as the others, but somebody has got to be buttoned down in this group, you know, otherwise it would go off the rails quickly. Um, you know, but you look at every person, whether it's Jeff Graves, you know, in IT, you know, this is a collective building as an organization. You look at Reggie Scott, and his team and the amazing work that they do. Uh, the Rams are a tapestry of unbelievably talented people who are committed to working together in a pursuit of perfection, but love doing what they do, but are fearless, mm -hmm. right? And I think part of the fearless is, you know, I would say great cultures are ones where people can speak their mind openly. They can challenge one another. They can ask questions and it's in the pursuit of getting better and people trust that everybody's intentions are aligned the same way. And, and that is what you know, our building has, uh, but it, it starts at the top with, with Sean and Les, and then ultimately with the latitude, those are given by Stan. Thank you. We'll go to Michael and then Daniel. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, Kevin, I probably should have asked you this two years ago when we first got a glimpse, a tour of the stadium when it first opened and, and knowing me, I probably did. I <laughs> just don't remember, but you mentioned this is the first time it's going to be full. They're increasing the capacity to over a hundred thousand. I'm asking you specifically how they do that. Uh, so I know 
the logistics of it. And then what other events coming up? I'm assuming the national championship Olympics world cup, will they be doing that again for Michael? I wish they were adding capacity to hundred thousand because it would make my job a lot easier this week. The NFL's capacity is right around 70,000, which is, you know, kind of our normal capacity uh, without standing room only seats. Most games we've sold a few thousand standing room only seats this year. We've been careful because of COVID. So we've been, most of Rams games have kind of been 72, 73 K. Uh, give or take is where we've cut things off. And, and I think the NFL, I don't know where the final manifest will be. That's a better question for Peter O'Reilly and his team, uh, but it'll be somewhere around 70,000. We can go to a hundred thousand. Uh, if you look at the standing room platforms on level three, level six, level eight, you know, that's really where you fill people in. And so, you know, we have an amazing run of events coming to SoFi stadium. You have the college football playoff, um, you know, in 2023, the national championship and, you know, if this year's an invocation, maybe uh, UCLA or USC will be playing in that game. Uh, maybe they'll be playing each other, uh, which would be an amazing event. Uh, we have WrestleMania coming in 2023. Uh, we are bidding on the World Cup in 2026. We're fortunate enough uh, to host uh, the opening and closing ceremonies of the Olympics in, in 2028. So what an amazing run coming from SoFi Stadium. And we're already uh, back at the NFL's doorstep asking how we get back into the Super Bowl rotation. But Look, I, you know, the one thing is Super Bowls in Los Angeles are amazing, but they're not a given. Um, and we as a host committee have to go earn the right to go host another Super Bowl. Uh, and by delivering, you know, Kathy and her team and everybody who's put in the work, uh, the next two weeks are going to be critical. And, you know, the weather looks great, knock on wood. Uh, I don't want to be Steve Martin in LA story and, and throw up the sunshine, you know, on just yet and have it turn out to rain, but um, uh, everything looks like it's a go. The stadium is beautiful and it'll be up to us to execute the next two weeks. And, you know, I think when the world turns their eyes to SoFi Stadium, we had 50 million people watching the NFC championship game on a beautiful, beautiful day uh, in LA. And, you know, my friends back in New England who were digging out from two feet of snow um, from, from a blizzard, I think they probably all want to move here uh now so hopefully we get another picture perfect day uh in la in two weeks and we deliver on the promise that that we first envisioned for sofi stadium uh on the drawing board thanks kevin la story great reference great movie great movie daniel you're up all right uh, hi kevin uh you, you touched on this a little bit but i wanted to ask specifically um just looking back over the past six years how satisfied are you with the progress the Rams have made in terms of cultivating, recultivating, building a fan base in Los Angeles and, and gaining a foothold in Los Angeles? Uh, proud, encouraged, but never satisfied. Um, you know, I think our team has done an amazing job. We, you know, I look back in 2016, we showed up at an office with roughly 30 people um, intent on, you know, capture, you know, rebuilding, uh, the NFL in a market that had been without it in 20 years. And, you know, I, I think the, the one thing is, you know, people always said during the NFL's absence that, you know, Los Angeles did not need the NFL. Um, and I, and I think that that's true. Uh, you know, Los Angeles did just fine in those 20 years of the NFL. I think what people have seen over the past six years and certainly, you know, this past Sunday is Los Angeles is a much better place with a thriving NFL team in it. Um, it brings together people in a unique way. Uh, it brings out civic pride. You know, you, I would say you can measure your growth in Los Angeles by the number of car flags you see. Uh, and in the past three days, I've seen more Rams car flags than I've ever seen before. Um, so to me, that, that's the hallmark of what we're doing. But the growth in the community, the growth in fandom, uh, our job is to make Los Angeles a better city through the power of football. Um, and I, I think we have started to do that over the past six years, again. Are you ever satisfied? Never satisfied. Um, and I don't, you know, there's never this aha moment where you say we've done it. Um, and I think the moment you start thinking of that, the moment you are underestimating the power of Los Angeles. You know, I, people would always ask me, you know, listen, when we first got here in 2026, when people look back after 10 years of the NFL being in Los Angeles, you know, the other 30 one owners put their implicit faith in Stan Kroenke and our organization to deliver upon the promise of Los Angeles. That isn't done in five years and six years. That's done over decades. 
Uh, that was such an immense challenge to our organization um, and to what we did to uphold those owners' faith in us, the NFL's owner, you know, the league office's faith in us. And I still feel like we have to deliver upon that every day. Um, I will, you know, never be more humbled than that moment in Houston in, in 2016 when the NFL said, we're giving you this opportunity to go build a stadium and, you know, redefine the NFL in Los Angeles. Uh, one of the greatest challenges in sports business and in sports over many decades, um, and, and one of which, you know, I'll always be forever grateful, and that will forever drive all of us. I, I know it drives Stan. I know it drives me. I know it drives everybody in our organization. Um, it's a really humbling thing. And am I proud of what we've accomplished over the past six years? You bet we all are. Uh, I, you know, the NFL is too hard. Sports is too hard not to take pride in, in what the 300 men and women of this organization have done, what the players and coaches uh, have done. Um, but do I think by any means that, you know, we should be satisfied? Never, never. And, and I can tell you this, right. You know, all you have to do, we had, trying to keep me on, I'm trying to count here, right. We had, you know, what do we play? Eight regular season games, two postseason games. So 10, 10 games and, you know, two preseason games. You know, of those 10, 10 regular season and postseason games, we had eight amazing buildings. That atmosphere, you know, against the Arizona Cardinals for our wild card game on Monday night was one of the best true Los Angeles sports atmospheres I've been in. But all you have to do, if we're being really honest, is look at week 18 and look at the NFC championship game and say, we have work to do, right? You know, too many 49ers fans in that building. And is that a reflection upon decades of being gone in Los Angeles and kids growing up rooting for different teams, the 49ers success. Absolutely. It's a great credit to the 49ers. It's also a reminder to every person in our organization of the work we have to do. Um, until that building is hundred percent Rams fans for every game, until it looks like the wild card for every game, we're going to have work to do. And look, is that visiting teams are always going to come in and travel well to Los Angeles. So, you know, when I worked in Florida, that was the case. We, we work in Las Vegas, like great markets, you know, with warm weather and great stadiums are a magnet for visiting team fans. If I lived in Buffalo, I would want to come to Los Angeles too in December. Um, you know, and, and I'm sure you're going to see that with Cincinnati uh, next week, right? I'm, I just saw they're under a winter weather watch for like the third straight week. You know, I'm sure they're all saying they want to come to Los Angeles. We have so much work to do um, to deliver upon the faith that those 31 owners in the league office handed to us and that Stan and his family handed to our organization. And, you know, there will never be a day we'll look back and say it's done. We'll, we'll go to Stu and then Jordan to close it out. Hey, Kevin, um, in terms of just capitalizing on this moment, when it's all said and done, what do you hope it represents, not only in the franchise's history, but uh, the city of LA's as well? I, I hope it represents the Los Angeles Rams' first Lombardi trophy uh, and, and a parade in Los Angeles. That, that's the hope. Um, what I, there, there are two things I truly hope come out of the next two weeks. One, I hope everybody in Los Angeles enjoys having the Super Bowl here in our community. Uh, you know, Kathy and her team have worked relentlessly for five years to showcase the best of Los Angeles, to showcase our hotels, our restaurants, our tourism industry, our downtown, our beaches, our tourist attractions. I hope first and foremost that Los Angeles shines uh, for these next two weeks because that's so important to our city as we come, you know, I feel like an idiot having said for the past two years, this was going to be the first post pandemic event. And, and here we are, you know, square in, you know, maybe not a post pandemic event, but I want this to represent, you know, the beginning of Los Angeles's next chapter as we emerge from, from COVID and showcase, you know, the unbelievable power of our city uh, to the rest of the United States, to the world. This is such a great opportunity for Los Angeles to be the centerpiece of the world. In the universe, when you think about all the countries, all the people, hundreds of millions of people worldwide who watch the Super Bowl, what an unbelievable, unique challenge for Los Angeles. I hope 
the, the work we do over the next two weeks between the host committee, our team, our fans showcases the best of Los Angeles. You know, if you're talking about true impact, that is the most impactful thing we can do because that impacts the lives of every Angelino, everybody in this region, and will serve, you know, whether we're playing football games or not, whether it's the fall or not, that will serve to showcase Los Angeles in the best possible way and put us on a great path. For the Rams, I hope people look back on the next two weeks and say, we brought the city together. That, you know, the power of sports to bring different neighborhoods, uh, different ethnicities, different cultures, you know, different regions together behind one common cause. Uh, and if we can galvanize this community, you know, to have one heartbeat and one voice, that would highlight the power of sports, the power of the Rams, the power of the NFL to truly impact lives and make a difference in Los Angeles. And those are the two things I hope for most. And that is the challenge to, to everybody in our building in the community to make that come to life. Um, none of that is dependent on the result of Super Bowl 56. Uh, that would just be the icing on the cake of a true fairy tale. You know, I would say if you, if you were writing the Hollywood story to come back, to, to fell your biggest rival in the biggest game, you know, in your new stadium for the right to play a Super Bowl, that is the Hollywood story. You just have to make sure that, you know, I don't want to have to write the sequel, you know, where we disappoint at the end of the first version and come back and have to try to climb the mountain again. Uh, some sequels work. You also get like city slickers too, right? So, you know, at, at the end of the day, you know, our goal is to finish this, you know, Sean has said all year to our team, you know, write your own story. Each chapter you need to write and make it authentic and finish. What better way to write our own story than by finishing uh, with a chance to hold a Lombardi in our own stadium, you know, for the first time here in Los Angeles. Thank you. And we'll go to Jordan to close it out. Um, this is a text in question from the athletics, Rich Hammond, um, with the Bengals announcing their uniform combo this morning. Uh, do you guys have any updates on what the Rams will be wearing Sunday, next Sunday? Uh, I didn't think we were allowed any surrogate questions. <laughs> um, and, and so I, I would decline to answer. We, we saw the Bengals post this morning that they will be wearing black. So now it's up to us to to go announce our uniform choice and that'll be coming forth soon. Thanks, Kevin.